Chapter 16, your analysis, body fluids, and other specimens. This again is going to cover the chapter objectives. We're going to talk about the other side of the non-blood products that we handle when we work as full botanists in lab. The introduction, collection and transporting urine and other body fluid specimens. It's difficult to obtain sometimes, especially when we're looking at biopsies or um, biopsies that require a physician to complete like cerebral spinal fluid. The quality of the test result is only as good as the specimen that's collected and we're going to adhere to standard precautions. Again, I can't stress enough, the laboratory requisition and label must accompany every specimen. Labels must include, and I'm going to have you review this on your own, it should be the patient's name, patient's identification number, the date, the time of collection, the type of specimen, and the initials of who oversaw the collection and the attending physician's name. This is some examples of a urine collection container. We're going to affix the label on the container right here, not on the lid. Routine urinalysis, or UA, most frequently requested laboratory procedure, useful indication of body health. It's performed on first morning or random specimens, and it detects diseases and disorders. It includes a chemical and physical and sometimes microscopic analysis of the urine sample. The physical properties include color, transparency versus cloudiness, odor, and concentration is detected through specific gravity measurements. The chemical analysis determined by using plastic reagent strips impregnated with a color reactive substance that tests for the presence of glucose, protein, blood, red blood cells and hemoglobin, white blood cells, ketones, bacteria, bilirubin, and other constitutes. We will be performing this in lab. Single specimen collection, the preferred urine specimen for most analysis is the first, first of the morning when urine is most concentrated. The specimen should be transported to the UA section promptly for analysis within two hours after the patient voids. Transportation or analysis cannot occur within this time period. The urine should be refrigerated. U urine culture and sensitivity, also referred to CNS. Urine culture and sensitivity urine collection. We're going to provide what's called a midstream clean catch urine collection. The patient is instructed to void approximately two thirds of the urine into the toilet collecting approximately one-fourth in a readily available sterile container and allow the rest to pass them to the toilet. This provides and eliminates bacteria components that could end up in this type of specimen. This is used to detect the presence or absence of bacterial organisms. Transport to microbiology section promptly. I'm going to have you review these slides on your own for the clean catch midstream urine collection. Instructions for women and men. Timed urine collections for creatinine and clearance tests, urobiology and determinations in hormone studies. 24-hour urine specimens must be obtained. Be aware that the protocol for collecting a 24-hour urine specimen must be able to assist in prevention of collection errors. I will cover this in detail in class, so I'm going to have you review the process and procedures for 24-hour urine collection in the next couple slides. Again, I'm having you review this on your own. I will cover this in detail in class. Please be aware down here, we need to know the start collection date and time and the end collection date and time to determine if it's within that 24-hour period we need. And again, I'm going to cover these slides in detail in class. We're going to instruct the patient to urinate prior to having a bowel movement. 
um, just because we don't want to get any contaminants. Um, uh, bowel movement actually could cause our urine sample obviously to be contaminated, but could it, also, it could also start killing off bacteria that is present in our urine. Urine cytology. Cytology is a discipline in which the body cells are studied to detect various diseases, including inflammation, inflammatory disorders, and cancers. Um, one procedure is the pap stain, and cytology specimens can be obtained from urine as well as the cerebrospinal fluid or other bodily fluids. Cerebral spinal fluid obtained by a physician through a spinal tap or lumbar puncture collected by the medical staff to diagnose meningitis, brain abscess, central nervous system cancers, multiple sclerosis, and other disorders. Also commonly done on patients who have fevers of unknown origin, um, specifically when they're looking at the meningitis diagnosis. Collected in three sterile containers, the first container usually is sent to and I'll have you fill in the blank. The second tube is used for clinical chemistry, and the last tube is used for hematology. The first tube is sent to microbiology and immunology studies. Sorry about that. Um, tests commonly performed, total protein levels, microbiological chloride levels, cell count, glucose level, is just some common tests performed on cerebral spinal fluid. The CSF specimen for chemistry should be refrigerated, and the CSF tube for clinical microbiology and hematology should be kept at room temperature. Reasons for stool specimens, we can detect parasites over in parasites. Um, Entric disease organisms, Salmonella, Shigella, Staph aureus, um, viruses are some other um, reasons that we might request a fecal sample, also occult blood. Um, this is done by home collection, so we give the patient a container and instruct the patient to avoid urinating in the container because urine can kill the microorganisms in the collected stool specimens. Instruct the patient to wash the outside of the specimen container after collection. Um, please be aware with home collection, they must be promptly sealed to prevent leakage and contamination. And for a child, the container can be placed under a toilet seat so the child can sit on the toilet to leave the sample. The specimen must be transported to the laboratory immediately. Maintain the specimen at room temperature or body temperature for detection of parasitic infections. Occult blood testing. Laboratory determination of occult blood assists in confirmation of presence of blood in black stools and can be helpful in detecting GI tract lesions and colorectal cancer. Feces for occult blood tests are often collected by patients during special testing cards. They're called SureFab tests, and they look like this. Reasons for semen fluid examination determine the effectiveness of a vasectomy. Investigate the possibility of sexual crime, criminal charges, assess fertility. We will assess sperm counts underneath a microscope to determine the type and quantity of the sperm. Instruction for pro proper specimen collection. Um, semen must be collected in containers that are clean and free of trace detergents. Specimens must be exposed must not be exposed to extremes of temperature or light prior to being submitted to clinical laboratory and should be transported within two hours of collection. Amniotic fluid, reasons for amniotic fluid collection. Fetal abnormalities can be detected through chromosomal analysis and chemical tests. Transportation precautions, the specimen must be protected for light and transported immediately. Synovial fluid, this is extracted from the joint cavities. When transporting synovial fluid to laboratory, use safety measures and transportation process. These are other bodily fluids that we might get in our lab. Pleural fluid, which is from the lung cavities, transport the bodily fluid to laboratory, again, using um, safety precautions. Pericardial fluid is fluid surrounding the heart. Peritoneal fluid, this is aspirations from the fluid from the abdominal cavity. Um, please be aware we need to label where we got the specimen and what it is because a lot of these would be a clear fluid. Um, proper transportation and labeling, I will have you review this slide on your own. Culture swabs, throat swabs, we've talked about doing strep and flu swabs. There's also sinus drainage, wound tissue, ear and eye cultures, and skin scrapings. 
Um, a buccal swab is a sample from the cheek or mouth of a patient. It involves swabbing the inside of the patient's cheek with a special swab. We want to avoid, when we do buccal swabs, we want to avoid um, contaminating the specimen by getting anything from the tongue or the back of the throat. Sputum collection fluid from the lungs containing pus. Collection in a sterile container. Collected in a sterile container for microbiology specimens to test for pathogenic organisms, including tuberculosis, used for determination of respiratory infections. Caution is needed in collection and transportation because there is a preservative in the bottom of the container that is poisonous. This is an example of a patient collecting a sputum specimen. I'm going to have you review the collection process for sputum specimens. We're going to attain the specimen in early morning, preferably upon rising. This instructs the patient on how to collect the container and also avoid the contaminating the outside of the container as well. They're going to collect about one to two teaspoons of sputum and then close the lid of the container. And I'm going to have you review these slides on your own, which is collecting of a sputum specimen. Nasopharyngeal culture collections. This is often used to detect carrier states of necessary meningitis, corneal bacterium, streptococcus pyrinogenes, um, H. influenza, which is the flu, and Staph aureus. For infants and children from whom so significant sputum cultures are difficult to obtain, a nasopharyngeal culture may be used to diagnose whooping cough, croup, and pneumonia. Throat swab collection. Throat cultures are most commonly obtained to determine the presence of streptococcal infections, collected by either screening methods or microbiological cultures. And again, this is going over the collection procedures for throat culture. I will have you review this, these slides on your own. I mean, some facilities, a rapid test is performed directly from the throat swab. Skin tests, allergy tests. The allergy test is performed on the patient's forearm or back using a common procedure called the prick technique. And this is what it looks like. We don't perform these as phlebotomists, but please be aware this is something we might get in the lab, um, especially if they are doing a prick test along with a blood test for allergy determination. TB skin tests administered for TB tests using an automatic device are pulling 1.1 ml of a diluted antigen. Um, we also now have the TB quantiferin gold test, which is something the phlebotomist would have to be performed. This is just how this procedure is performed. I will have you review these slides on your own. Gastric analysis determines the acid level or the amount of acid is that's produced in an individual's stomach. The stomach gastric contents are emptied through a, a gastric tube. The test involves passing a tube through the patient's nose. Incu in, intubated and into the stomach, which looks like this. We might get the syringe for analysis in the lab, so you just need to be aware of what it looks like. I will have you review these slides on your own. This is just gastric analysis and also to um, how we label the specimen. Breath analysis for peptic ulcers. H. pylori is a bacteria that damages the stomach or in intestinal lining and is linked to ulcers and stomach cancers. A positive H. pylori test, antibody, antigen, or breath test indicates the patient has been infected with this organism, and we performed this in our lab um, earlier in the semester. Sweat chloride, I will review this in class. It's diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Um, patients with cystic fibrosis actually produce sweat chloride at two to five times the normal level. And I will have you review these slides on your own because I will be covering this in detail in class. Um, please be aware with the sweat chloride test, we will perform this in duplication to determine um, if it's effective. We also now have a blood test for cystic fibrosis. 
which the system isn't commonly used, but sometimes it's less invasive for a child. Um, this concludes chapter 16. Please again review this prior to class.